Oh, they're, they're not there anymore. Sorry, I've had new plug sockets in. The, what I used to use for the, the on-air sign isn't... Oh, that's, that's a spanner in the works. There we go. Right, let's get on with it. Let's get down to business to defeat the Huns. <laughs> I watched Milan the other day and it's cracking. Okay, first question. Who are you most excited for? David Tennant and Catherine Tate making a return for their 60th anniversary specials, or shooting out Warren Miller Gibson making their first appearances of the Doctor and Ruby Sunday in Series 14? I'm excited for both, but this is a very easy answer, the latter one, Shooty and Millie, because obviously Tennant and Tate, it's exci as exciting as it is, we have seen them before, and it will, let's face it, it will be fan service. I mean, probably very good fan service, but fan service, we've seen this stuff before, but Shooty and Millie, you know, it's new and exciting, and you know, th there's a lot of potential because of how great of performers they are, you know, Sh Shooty Gatwa, after seeing some of his sex education, you know, work on that, or, or work on that show, I think he's got absolutely what it takes to be the Doctor, but still making it his own. And Millie Gibson, I've seen some of her acting in uh, Coronation Street, like some clips and whatnot, and again, really good. And they all, they also both have really great chemistry. So I think they're just, um, there's so much potential and possibilities for what Series 14 holds, and I'm just really excited. And seeing some of the stuff, you know, like the 60s outfits that we saw the other week, I mean, that was like just, oh, I'm really excited for this new era. Next up, favourite comedians. Uh, I'm going, I mean, there's a few comedians that I do like, I mean, I usually prefer British comedians just because I prefer British humour. So, like, but there are some great American comedians like Robin Williams was what you know, was incredible. Um, Don Rickles always quite funny. Chris Rock's pretty funny as well. But for me, I'm going to say Ricky Gervais. Now I know he's kind of a marmite comedian. You either love his stuff or you hate his stuff. And I know I know some people think he's kind of a bit boring in one note. Like I was having a conversation with Ronnie the other day, and he sort of he basically said that kind of his blunt style is all he's got. Like almost like a one trick pony. Personally. I really admire that about him. He's, he's got confidence, and I really admire that. But I just find him funny, whether it is his stand-up or his, you know, scripted shows and whatnot. Like, in, I was watching, over February and March, I was watching Extras, the sitcom that he did, and I was absolutely just dying, because it, it, it's a show that I love to watch and hate to watch, because it's that kind of cringe comedy. That just, it, it's just, oh, man. <laughs> oh, it's qu quality. Biggest movie disappointment, as in the movie you're most disappointed by. I think if we're looking at, like, cinema... Disappointments. I'm going to say the uh, Crimes of Grindelwald, the Fantastic Beasts sequel, because I enjoyed the first one, and you know I enjoy it now, like still enough, like enough. But when I even you know back in 2018, I would give, I'd say everything was, you know, I'd be like, oh, this is all, everything's great. But even then, I was let down. I was thinking, oh, that's a bit of a, a let down, isn't it? It's just, just nothing happened. It, I think that's a dire film, and I didn't really like Secrets of Dumbledore that much either. Didn't redeem it, so yeah. But as for some sort of wider films that I'm kind of going back to, like older films, let's say, the de facto one for me is Pan's Labyrinth because it's a film that I have to do for my film class, um, and I watched it, and you know, it's it's a you know it's critically lauded. It won a couple of Oscars. It's you know lauded as like Del Toro's best film. It's worthy enough apparently to be on an academic study. And actually, in my A Thousand and One Movies book, which doesn't have a lot from anything post millennial, um, Pan's Labyrinth is in it. So. I, I just, I didn't connect with it because I thought I was expecting something really, you know, this powerful drama and it just didn't connect with me. And, you know, I've rewatched it, I've had to study it, and I've heard every counter argument to mine, and I just don't connect with it. And that's fine, but, you know, I just can't help how I feel about it. As for other films that I was disappointed by, recently I watched The Third Man, the old Orson Welles sort of noir film. There's some great elements to it, but personally I didn't get it because it's kind of a, like, kind of a mystery thriller. I didn't really get into it. I didn't really, yeah, it was a bit sort of, I was a bit unengaged and I didn't really get it. Also, I do like this film, but Fantastic Mr. Fox, the Wes Anderson adaptation, I, I it's a good film, like very well directed, very well animated, a very charming story, but I, I know a lot of people like rave about it, say it's one of the best animated films out there. I mean, Letterboxd loves it, and I, I wouldn't, I don't know, It's. I don't think it's that good, personally. Favourite guilty pleasure film? Okay, there's, there's there's two very obvious ones for me. Cars 2 and Diamonds Are Forever. Like, Cars 2 it was my first film at the cinema, so no matter, you know, there's <laughs> gaping flaws in it. You know, it's a terrible sequel. Uh, the plot makes no sense. Why is Mate of the Protagonist? I get that. But it's if it's so fun and entertaining and energised and fast-paced. You know, the action is fantastic. The animation is gorgeous. The locations are great. The music is really good. The... You know, some of the race scenes are awesome, and I, I, you know, 
He's not the best spy in the world, but Finn McMissile is cool as a cucumber. Speaking of spies, Diamonds Are Forever, look, it's lowbrow, 70s, trashy, campy, schlock, like Boerfeld in drag, they're in Vegas and LA. But I have, I have a massive stupid grin on my face every time I watch that film, it's just fun. What's the Doctor Who story you go back to whenever you feel your love for the show fading? I, honestly, as of late, I have kind of been feeling like that, sort of. I was, I, I tell you what though, I was on a a trip, like a sort of a long, it was like a good like six hour trip and I downloaded a couple episodes of Doctor Who, I downloaded the Pandorica series 5 two-parter and the Rings of Akaten and those two were just like, it reminded me how much I love it because they were just magic, at least. The series 5 finale is just magical, it's so entertaining, it's just so, it's basically series 5 in a nutshell and it just br brings so much joy. And then the Rings of Akaten, I think, is so sort of thematically brilliant, and because it's how un how underrated it is, I always feel like with that one because of how much I adore it, I'm sort of sticking up for the underdog, and that's kind of yeah, I think that one, those two were really sort of something. The funniest joke in a Doctor Who story. You know, you're a classic example of the inverse ratio between the size of the mouth and the size of the brain. I've never met a European who likes pineapple on his pizza. Where do you stand on this issue? Oh, 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 that pineapple on pizza is the bee's knees, I am telling you, right? It is just amazing. Ham and pineapple, bro, I love it. It's probably my, probably my favourite pizza. I, I think it's great. Is it okay to refer to Brits as Europeans, or do you think of some of yourselves being somewhat removed from the continent? And well, like, geographically, we are technically part of Europe, even though we are sort of separated, like, land, because of, like, the English Channel and the Northern Sea. But technically, we are separated from land, but we are geographically in Europe because of the whole EU Brexit stuff. But even then, I think we've always considered ourselves sort of separate. Um, I, I don't know, really. I mean, I, I don't really care, to, to be honest. I, I just, I don't really know. I don't really mind, really. I believe you mentioned being in a stage production recently. I did mention that in an older Q&A. If so, do you care to tell us more about it? So basically, the thing is, I've done a few shows this year, like um, a couple of school shows, but then... In January, the uh, um, an actual Amdram uh, musical, it was uh, for, for you know performed to the public in in the local community. Um, I I don't want to go like in too much detail. Like I want to maybe give it a bit more time for it to sort of, but a bit more time to pass. Maybe in like a year's time, I might sort of say what it was and whatnot. But uh, yeah, I I really enjoyed it, and I you know I think yeah I I really enjoyed that one. If you go on holiday this summer, is there any chance you might vlog it? Um. I'm not really a kind of vlog person. I don't really do that sort of thing, but I do sometimes like to get sort of, sort of stock footage of the places that I go to because then I can maybe use it in videos. Like, when, like for example, when I went to Liverpool, um, I I got a little bunch of stock footage for that and made it sort of general enough that I could use it for any video and then ended up using it in a Road to the Multiverse. And also when I went to the beach last uh, August, which is when I had that uh, the, the boat clip from, I used bits of that in the Bond video films of the summer video. I used it in that video. You mentioned having a dog before. Have you ever shown or told us what kind of dog you have? Well, um, I filmed this little clip actually yesterday. So roll the clip. Now I thought just to quickly answer this question about, about my dog. Uh, she's just having a little lie down. She's a bit tired now, but uh, this is Belle. Um, she's, we've had her for about uh, 11 years now. And I think she's aged like fine wine. We love you, Bubba. Yeah. Are we still expecting the next Doctor episode to air in November? What about the new Doctor? Will a new season be weekly episodes? Well, the 60th anniversary stuff will, I'm guessing, be in November because that is the 60th anniversary of the show. So I can expect that. And then uh, Shooty Gatwa and, you know, the Series 14 will be, I'm assuming, 2024. And also, I think they're meant to be eight episode series now. Um, but apparently, we'll be getting them yearly, so more consistently. So. That's, that's that's a good sign. Why are you so good at reviews? Oh, okay, I need to strike my own ego there. Uh, I mean, as a film student, it, it doesn't help. Like, I can't help but not pick apart films. Like, I'm what, you know, I'll be watching Vertigo and I'm thinking, Jimmy Stewart's car's green, Kim Novak's dress is green, the lights outside the hotel are green, they're in a park and it's got green, they're in a forest and there's greenery, it all means something. I can't watch a film and just enjoy it now. I have to look at every... Um, detail. It's it's that's the curse of being a reviewer. Who will be the next James Bond? Absolutely not a clue. They they're very. The thing is, the producers after Daniel Craig's left, they've been very like tight lipped. There's like there's they're not even casting yet. They've not got a script, and yet the tabloids like the Sun and the the 
Mirror and all these tabloids. They're saying that Aaron Taylor Johnson's going to be the new Bond, and he's not. That's been denied. And there was that rumour the other day, I remember seeing it, that um, like Daisy May Cooper was going to be the new M or something. Like, I swear tabloids have a sadder life than me. I don't want to work at a tabloid, because you're just, you're just picking stuff out of thin air. Indian or Chinese takeaway? You cheeky bugger, that's not a very fair question. I love both. I do love both. But I'm going to say, because I haven't had them that often in comparison. I'm gonna say Chinese takeaway, only because I haven't had that, I haven't had as many as Indian takeaways in sort of recent times. Okay, favorite film of each decade. Right, I'm gonna start with the 1920s because that's the oldest film, I've, that's the oldest, like, that's where the oldest film I've seen comes from. And I should also say that until we get to like the 60s, I have a very limited pool of films to pick from, so. Let's go. So for the 20s, I'm going to pick Sunrise, A Song of Two Humans, the old silent film. For the 30s, I've seen literally two films, so I'm going to say The Wizard of Oz because it's like one of the earliest films I remember sort of growing up with and I just, it's magic, isn't it? For the 40s, I, again, I've barely seen anything, but I'm going to pick It's a Wonderful Life. For the 50s, I'm going to say Ace in the Hole, the Billy Wilder film with Kurt Douglas, I'm going to say that. That's my favourite Billy Wilder film, by the way. Now for the 60s, I'm going to give, I'm going to give a tie answer. I'm going to say either Billy Wilder's The Apartment or Mike Nichols, The Graduate. I'm, I'm just, I'm going to say The Apartment for now, but I have a feeling that as time goes on, The Graduate will overtake it because for me, they are both neck and neck, but I feel like The Graduate will overtake it eventually. For the 70s, I'm going to say Alien, Ridley Scott's Alien. I think it's not my, or quite my all-time favourite film, but for me, it's probably the closest there is to a perfect movie, if I'm being perfectly honest. My favourite film of all time comes from the 80s with Ferris Bueller's Day Off by John Hughes. Just, I think it's a film that really connected with me on such a level that I just can't explain. For the 90s, I'm going to say, I'm gonna say The Lion King for now, but again, a bit like The um, the Apartment in the 60s decade, I feel like they could change over time because the 90s has some amazing films like Goodfellas, Reservoir Dogs, Pulp Fiction, you know, some serious contenders for the 90s. For the 2000s, I'm going to say Shaun of the Dead, the Edgar Wright film. For the 2010s, I'm going to pick uh, Whiplash by Damon Chazelle. And then for the 2020s, again, I know there's not a lot that we can pick from, but again, like The Wonderful Life, it'll take really something special to beat it. Everything, everywhere, all at once from last year. Just a beautiful film, and it's worthy of all the praise. Favourite decade of Doctor Who? Right, Oh, Okay, for me, it would be a toss-up between the 60s, the 70s, and the 2010s. Because um, I love all of them. I think, right, I'm going to discount the 2010s because the highs of the 2010s, I adore. It's kind of probably would be my favourite Doctor Who, but there are some, there's some crap in the 2010s, like Series 9 and Series 11 that I don't like. But, um, yeah, really don't like those ones. I'm probably going to say the 70s, yeah. I mean, there is something magical about the 60s Doctor Who, but the 70s for me is where Doctor Who... Um, you know, it, it obviously, you know, developed and changed and was kind of very secure with what it was at that time. So it could really afford to experiment and do unique things, you know, stories like Genesis the Daleks, The Deadly Assassin, um, The Key to Time Saga, you know. There, there's so much variety in the 70s and they really experiment and do daring, brave, bold things. And that is what I really love, you know, there's, there's obviously the unit earthbound stuff, very gritty and with bond desk. You've got the horror, Hammer Horror-esque stuff of the early Tom Baker years, you've got the more comedic stuff of the Grant Williams era, which um, is hit and miss, but I, I do really like season 16, and I don't mind season 17, actually, but yeah, I, I think there's just so much variety, there's so much with the six, uh, 70, sorry, and it's just the decade I connect with most, probably. And also, Tom is my favourite classic Doctor, so there, there's that as well in its favour. Your top five trilogies, right, there's three, now when I read this question, there was three that came immediately to mind, those being the Cornetto trilogy, you know, Shaun of the Dead, Hot Fuzz, World's End, the original Star Wars trilogy, A New Hope, Empire Strikes Back, Return of the Jedi, and the Back to the Future trilogy. Those would are the easy, those are definitely my three favourites, like depth for definite. I can't, I, I'm really struggling with the fourth and fifth. I'm going to say because I've seen it recently, the Kung Fu Panda films, um, unironically I love them, because, I mean, not only they're really fun and entertaining and, you know, got plenty of memes, but also, just on a technical and story level, they are really rich, you know, the action is phenomenal, especially in the first one. The music's amazing, the, the animation is stunning, the stories and the characters are so rich with emotion. And the second one is unironically amazing, a genuine, almost a masterpiece, I would consider it, because it's that good. Even the third one, which isn't nearly as good, I still enjoy it because I love the world and the characters that much. And then for the fifth one, I'll pick the Captain America trilogy because, 
Uh, because I think he's it. It's probably the most consistent Marvel trilogy. And I also really like how you know, Captain America probably stays the same, but the world evolve, evolves around him. And I, I like that kind of how he progresses and how he changes his mindset. Uh, and I, I just, I, 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 yeah, that's, yeah, I'll go with that one. And for the final question, how do you get ideas and motivation for videos? I've been really struggling with the, with this the last few months and I'd really like to post again. Well, well, I mean, that's why I'm, I'm sorry to hear that, you know, I mean, I'll be honest, I've felt similar. I think after I took that Halloween break back, you know, I took that break. It was good for me, but in terms of the channel, I feel like it, it might, the momentum just sort of went off. I, I've just lost that momentum with the channel. I, I don't post it. The what I post isn't for me what it once was. I, I you know, I think there's longer gaps and stuff and it just, it wasn't what it once was. And, uh. You know, I don't really know how, I don't really think I can help that. But, you know, I'm still soldiering on, yeah. But I think, I think the main thing I would say with that is to not consciously look for motivation and inspiration. That, in most cases, will come to you. Because it can, inspiration can come from the most random of places and at the most unexpected of times. I mean, prime example for me recently, The Invisible Killer. The short film that I made. I purely made that because it was snowing outside. And I was like, we don't get snow that much in England. Let's take some photos. Or maybe we could take a bit of stock video. Maybe maybe some video of me running down there. I could use that. And and then eventually I ended up crafting a little narrative around that. I put it all together, put some music in, you know, edited it and whatnot. And then I put it up and I, I'm really proud of that. It's probably one of my favourite. It's probably one of, if not the best video I've made this year so far. But yeah, it, it always comes from the most just random of places. But maybe something else I would say is sort of broadening your horizons, if that makes sense. What I mean is that, you know, we're often inspired by like the media, like, you know, films and shows and music and whatnot. So maybe sort of broadening your horizon can help, you know, listening to music that you don't often listen to or watching, you know, stuff that you don't usually watch, like music to different genres and whatnot. Yeah, I mean, me watching the Studio Ghibli films, which I've never seen until the end of last year, going through those, they honestly really inspire me creatively because they are so radically different from what I usually see, you know, in Western animation. They are so radically different, but they always inspire me. And that's why, that's why I like to watch a variety of films because it does broaden my perspectives, you know, watching older films or watching silent films, watching, you know, films from different countries and whatnot. It, it helps to... Broaden, and then it, you get a sort of a bigger palette of things that you can pick and choose from to inspire you. But I think always make it sh make sure it's personal to you. Don't just make something for the sake of it. it. You've got to really care about it. And it's however you're feeling. If you are feeling sort of demotivated, like is there a song that maybe conveys that feeling that that helps that sort of you identify in that sense? I don't know. But the main thing is to not consciously think about it and let it come to you naturally because that's when you'll get that's when you'll get the best results i think and on that note that's the last question so yeah thank you for watching um be sure to like subscribe and all that good stuff and uh, this clack of the geek signing out adios and also actually let's let's do a little thing where we uh, flip through the book and um the uh, movies book and see what film it lands on come on let's. and we're gonna see uh oh west side story the old uh, the old uh, west side story i have not seen that one Jesus loves you more than you will know. Whoa, whoa, whoa. God bless you. Oh, the jungle book. Look for the bare necessities, the simple bare necessities. Forget about your worries and your strife. I mean the bare necessities, oh, Mother Nature's recipes. And something, 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 life. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> oh, Christ almighty.